Hey folks, military gun guy here. I wanted to do a quick video on the Japanese Type 99 rifle. Um, this there's actually two rifles here, um, both from the Nagoya Art Arsenal. Um, one of them is the Japanese Type 99 long. The other is the Ch Japanese Type 99 short. Uh, a couple of differences. Um, I may not be able to see it quite that easy. There we go. Uh, you may notice that the Type 99 short, obviously this one in front, is shorter by about you know, five or six inches. Um, for the most part, the rifles are identical with a few notable exceptions. On the Type 99 long, uh, the barrel is 31 inches. Uh, the monopod is also slightly longer. And the barrel band, I'll show you here, the barrel band on the Type 99 short has uh, the side swivel for the monopod. Uh, it also has a rear swivel uh, on the left side, uh, and the anti-aircraft wings have, you may not be able to see it, but the little indentation for leading aircraft, I apologize for the camera noise, I was too lazy to get my other lens, but you'll see the little indentation um, for leading aircraft. Um, those were only on one side, on the Type 99 short. On the Type 99 long rifle, uh, you can see the length of the barrel. The bar the, the rear band uh, actually was had the swing the sling swivel underneath. Both the Series 35 Toyo Kogyo and the Nagoya, which only two arsenals that made them, had this unique type of barrel band. Also on the anti-aircraft sight, you will notice that there are two sets of divots uh, for the aircraft uh, wings. Make sure that thing's focusing properly. Uh, two sets of divots on either side of the anti-aircraft wings. Um, also, similar to the Type 38, there is a uh, sling swivel on the bottom. Uh, other than that, they are mostly identical. Um, like I said, the Type 99 long is obviously long. Uh, this is from the Nagoya Arsenal. They made roughly about 10,000 of these. Um, the other um, the other variant is the Series 35 uh, Toyo Kogyo. I uh, don't know why they jumped right away to Series 35, uh, but they did. Uh, those are unique in that on the bolt, um, instead of the, they had the chrome face bolt, uh, typical of many of the early war uh, Type 99s, but on the Toyo Kogyo, it was just a circle. It's actually kind of interesting how they did that. Now, I've had a bunch of people that have asked me about the dust covers on the Type 99, Type 38 type rifles. And so I'm going to do a little video today in addition to describing this rifle. Do a little addition, uh, uh, do a video on how to um, install the dust cover. Uh, this is a genuine Japanese dust cover. Um, you may not be able to see, but there are some numbers on the back, uh, serial numbers, arsenal mark. Um, and then on the early war rifles, up until about mid-war, um, there are grooves. These grooves right here that are machined into the receiver. It's also one down here. It's a little harder to see because it's hidden by the stock. Uh, those grooves are what guides this lip on the dust cover. Okay, so um, I've seen all manner of dust cover installations. Most of them are incorrect. People jam them on there hammer them on there. Um, this dust cover it just slides literally right in the groove and just slides back and forth just like that. Let me focus in a little bit. The camera's going to make all kinds of weird noises. So it slides in just like that. Uh, the dust covers were unique to the rifle, meaning that each dust, each dust cover was fitted at the factory. Uh, you may get lucky and get a dust cover that fits perfectly, or you may get one that once the bolt goes in, it rubs. It's just luck of the draw. They're kind of hard to adjust. Um, Either just deal with it or don't put it on there. Um, the Type 99 uh, dust covers were shorter. Focus, there we go. Uh, and they also had a bracket uh, that was, I believe, either riveted or welded um, onto uh, the unit itself. Um, this is a probably a mid-war uh, Type 99 dust cover. Um, they all fit the same. They all function the same. The, they were often discarded in the field because they just made too much damn noise. So in order to make this work, you take your bolt, okay? So this is your bolt's going to go into your rifle like this. You're going to take the dust cover, and you're just going to kind of basically hang it on there like that, okay? Focus camera, focus. Go back. 
There we go. So it's just going to kind of hang on there like that. Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take the bolt, okay, and you're just going to start it in the, uh, the races or the groove or however you want to do it. And then you're going to drop it. Okay. Try this again. So you're going to put it like that. Okay. And then what you're going to do, I'll put my hand on the top so you can see better. Then what you're going to do is you're going to line, you're going to push it forward a little bit and then you're going to actually line up the groove in the receiver. This is hard to do over the head. You line up the grooves in the receiver so that it will do like that. And so basically you're lining up, the left side goes in this little top groove, the right side goes in the groove that's almost hidden under the wood line. And then you just push the follower down a little bit, the dust cover goes forward, you got to push it past the bolt release, and there you go. That's pretty much it. Um, this st procedure is standard for all the Type 99 and Type 38 uh, dust covers, including the Type 44 and the Type 38 carbon. Um, you can see where they didn't like them. They did tend to rattle a lot in the noise. Uh, Japanese wanting to be having uh, night or not, but uh, basically silence on their patrols. Figured that this was one thing that they didn't actually need the travels. Um, and this is interchangeable. Uh, this is also um, this is a Series Three, I believe, Nagoya. Uh, you can open that up if you want. Makes it. I'll show my hand away. You open that up a little bit. It kind of helps it slide on a bit. But you can see when you got it lined up perfectly, that it literally just goes right into the groove. Okay. Push down your follower a little bit. Forward. Nice and perfect. And you can hear the amount of rattling in it. Um, other than that, that's about it. These are pretty straightforward. Um, you know. So like I said, though, don't be surprised if you buy a dust cover from you know one of the major distributors or even a, an authentic Japanese one. I've, I've, so I have several Japanese rifles. I have sometimes gone through five or six of them, uh, interchanging them between, ouch, between rifles uh, to see which one fits the best. Um, unfortunately, like I said, it is a luck of the draw. Um, and you, you, know, you might get a great one, you might not. So don't be too disappointed if it doesn't fit properly. Um, you know, the, you can tell the real ones because they will have the little, they'll have the serial number on the back and they'll have an arsenal mark, either Tokyo Artillery Arsenal, which has became Kokura, or the Nagoya. Um, I have not seen a Mukden Type 99 ever. Um, and then of course, as the war was, uh, and it was progressing badly for the Japanese, uh, these were omitted. They still machined the, uh, the grooves in there, but as these were omitted, and the rear anti-aircraft sights were emitted, and the monopods were emitted. Uh, pretty soon, even the late war rifles uh, did not have uh, even the dust cover grooves machined. Uh, let me show you something real quick on a late war rifle, which you can also see some of the different uh, features. So stand by for a sec. So this is one that you will probably almost never see. Um, I got lucky on this one on a gun broker auction. Uh, this is a Series 25 uh, Kokura uh, very late war Japanese Type 99 Arasaka. Um, this one is one of the last ditch, last ditch, or substitute standard. Um, there are a number of features that have been omitted, as you can tell, and I'll show you those in detail. Um, this was a war expedient rifle, sort of something that was safe enough to go bang, kill the enemy, and go from there. Um, this one is all matching. Um, you can see the amount of roughness and chatter. They were very uh, kind of quickly kind of shit out. Even you can see where it doesn't quite fit very well. This rifle is all matching uh, and I'll show you its most unique feature in a minute. Um, the rear sight is now a peep sight. Focus right there. There we go. The rear sight is now a simple peep sight. Very simple front band. Uh, very or sorry rear band very simple front band with the bayonet lug because of course the Japanese believed in using bayonets at all times. Uh, the chrome lining was omitted on this rifle. Uh, the Japanese were not in position to have chrome lining anymore. The, um, the reinforcing lug in the middle is obviously quite huge which is kind of interesting that they went to a, they went to a more a little more simpler design that's staked in place but oddly enough they use more metal in that one. Typical Type 99 uh, side swivel uh, has the wooden butt plate on this one. Um, you know, the metal was gone, so they were trying to figure out ways that they could save material and whatnot at every turn. Also, the Arsenal Inspector's marks 
which you would typically find on the bottom, which you will not see on this one, but you will definitely see on this one. These were the Arsenal inspection stamps. Okay, there we go. Arsenal inspection stamps, um, basically signifying the Arsenal is from, I believe this one was a Chigusa Arsenal, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see them, typically they're found there, and they're found there if they haven't been sanded off over the years. Um, on this Type 99 Long, uh, this one does have the chrysanthemum. This is a restore job. It was in horrible condition, a lot of rust and pitting and whatnot on it, so I cleaned it all up and got it all nice and pretty. Uh, this, the people say that this was struck with a bayonet. Japanese steel is legendary hard. Uh, more than likely this was hit with a chisel. I've owned two of these in the past, and both of them have been struck in about the same manner. Uh, the Type 99 Longs were uh, typically surrendered rifles. My rumor is they found a lot of them in warehouses, so a lot of them may not have even been issued to Japanese forces. Um, this one has a ground mum, as you can see. It's been ground off, also another surrendered rifle. Um, interestingly enough, and this is what makes this rifle so unique, is this. There is no mum, okay? This is a concentric circle rifle uh, on this series and this arsenal. There may have been, oh, roughly less than 2,000 made. Uh, the rumor is that they went to the Japanese secret police, the Kempetai. Uh, there's also rumors that they were issued to government forces that were not directly associated with the military. Um, you know, the Kempetai sounds cool, but uh, who knows? Uh, you know, I mean, nobody probably will ever know. Again, you can see the machining marks on this. Uh, how rough these were. They were they were very, very quickly kind of shit out, um, you know, and even in late war, like I said, even the stocks are quite rough. There's a, what's called chatter, where they just didn't finish them, as opposed to where you see the very fine machining on the Type 99 long, uh, even on the regular Type 99s, uh, and you can also see the degree of fit and finish on the stock. Uh, same with the Series 3. On the Nagoyas, they started to go to hell about the Series 6. They started uh, using more um, uh, war expedient uh, methods, uh, emitting things and whatnot. The Series 6 Nagoya is the most transitional of the rifles. And then you have the smaller arsenals and whatnot. So um, that's about it. Oh, also, on the Type 99, the last ditch, there are no grooves, as you can tell. There's nothing for the, uh, the dust cover. So they were done with that by late war uh, entirely. So anyway, that is the little primer on the Type 99 uh, Japanese Arasaka, uh, really fascinating rifles. There was about 40 different variants, roughly different arsenals, different sub arsenals and stuff. Um, each rifle is a little different. Um, you know the markings you can tell on them. This is a Nagoya marking. You can see there uh, Nagoya Arsenal, and then the serial number. These are what less than 8,000 of these were made. 10,000, so this is like number 40. 700, about in the middle of the series. Before the, they, they did about 10,000 of these, uh, about 25,000 of the Toyo Kogyos before they decided to abandon the project because the rifle was just too long. Um, and then they went with the more common Japanese Type 99 short rifle that you see on the market today. Um, so, yeah, very, uh, very interesting rifles. As the war progressed, they got worse and worse. Um, they're all safe. Um, you know, obviously you have it checked out by a gunsmith, if your gunsmith even knows anything about Japanese rifles. Um, but they're very safe to fire, just make sure you don't shoot full power 7.7 loads in a training rifle, because they're very similar. Um, but other than that, these guns were designed to fire and they were designed to kill, and that's exactly what they did. So, um, anyway, any questions, um, please hit me up, militaryguy 702 at gmail.com. Uh, leave a note on my, um, my YouTube channel if you like, subscribe. Uh, I'll have all kinds of other interesting stuff, including a Winchester 1897 shotgun restore and a uh, Yugoslavian M72 abomination that I just picked up recently, along with a few other uh, interesting things. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks for watching. And any questions, like I said, hit me up. Advice is always free. Thanks so much.